Thank you for joining us today. Um, as the title suggested, we're going to speak a little bit about um, some of the uh, scenarios that we're seeing uh, in India and um, some of the issues that students are facing as a result of that. And um, I would like to share some of my thoughts in terms of what we have uh, seen, heard over the years and what some of the concerns that are currently um, happening in, in India and uh, we just want to make sure that we uh, help you uh, navigate this process and, and get through it. Um, uh, we titled this session What an Agent Won't Tell You uh, mainly because a lot of the concerns and issues that we're seeing uh, is stemming from students who have been using agents in India or consultants as some call them. Uh, there have been some issues that are a little concerning, so we want to make sure that we address some of those issues and see what kind of questions or concerns you have. All right, so uh, kinds to, of agents. Uh, For the purpose of our session today, process. I'll describe three different kinds of agents that we see on the ground uh, in India. The first ones and the main ones that we see on the ground, which there are a lot of around the country, are what we refer to as commission-based agents or consultants. These are organizations or individuals who charge either the student or the university, and in some cases both, uh, money to provide them with the services students and families need to apply to colleges in the U.S. When they apply, when they charge a fee to a university, it's typically a commission, and the commission is based on the tuition and the fees that a student will pay the university. Um, and some agents, like I mentioned, also charge the students some fee as well, and I think many of them might charge a small fee just to kind of get you started on the process, but you, you've probably seen some of these kinds of organizations out there. The other kind of agent that we see on the ground are what we refer to as independent counselors. These are individuals who, for the most part, are professional counselors. They've been trained. They have the experience. Many of them might have even actually studied in the U.S. and now back in India providing a, a, a service to students. But these are organizations or individuals that work with a very a small number of students every year. And a lot of them are typically high achieving students that are applying to some very selective or Ivy League institutions. The engagement with these counselors is typically long term over a period of a year, year and a half, sometimes more than two years and they help you through the entire process of understanding the requirements uh, and preparing your resume and your portfolio accordingly. But they come with a uh, quite a bit of a, a monetary commitment on your part. They do charge a substantial fee and that's how they work and so that's why they only work with a small group of individuals. The last group of agents uh, we refer to are representative offices. Um, these are individuals or companies who represent a single university or a group of universities and for the most part don't charge a fee and don't work on a commission basis. I have seen organizations that are funded by a home university, whether it's a US or UK or Australian university in India. The person working there is an employee of the university, so they, in essence, are the India director or the India recruiter. There are other organizations that represent a variety of universities and uh, may charge a fee, may not charge a fee, but typically they don't charge a commission from the university. In our case, uh, GenX Education and the International Knowledge Center, we are a representative office. We're the official office in India for a consortium of universities. And, and we do not charge a fee to students or families in India, and nor do we charge a commission to the universities because we're funded by the consortium to provide all of our services on the ground. <clears throat> so let's talk about some advantages of using these agents. Uh, obviously, the, the reason there are a lot of these agents in India are because there are some advantages that they provide for students and families that are uh, obviously new to the process. It is a pretty complicated um, maze in terms of the number of universities, the requirements, and the programs available, et cetera, et cetera. So these folks actually provide a, a service that is useful if it is provided in, a, in an ethical and, and in a right way. Obviously, one of the biggest advantage of using an agent is it's their one-stop shop. 
they help you identify universities uh, that meet your interests and help you apply to these universities, understand the, the requirements that might vary from one to another university and help you apply to all of the ones that you want to. Uh, many of them offer end-to-end -end support, uh, including but not limited to writing essays or letters of recommendation, uh, the application preparation, they actually prepare and submit the application for you on their computers. Uh, they might help you with the visa interview preparation. Some even actually help you buy your plane ticket and, and plan your trip uh, to the U.S. once your uh, visa has been successfully granted. Um, the other advantage that we see is that they might help you identify universities that you may not have heard of. Uh, because of the uh, the way uh, brands are established in India and the way uh, students and families learn about these brands, there are a lot of universities that many have not heard of and sometimes these agents are able to introduce you to some of those brands and this is exactly the reason why universities partner with these agents so they can promote their universities on the ground. And I guess the most important advantage is they take the burden of the process away from you. So basically you walk into an agent's office and talk to them about your interests and they have you complete some paperwork, understand your profile, your interests, and then get the ball rolling. So you can sit back and relax and let them handle uh, the entire process. So those are some of the advantages of using agents in India. Now with advantages come some challenges. Uh, there are quite a few of them, and as I go through some of these points, I will share with you actual examples of uh, situations that we've come across, and over the last six and a half years of doing this, I have personally handled a lot of situations with students that they should not have been in in the first place. Um, the first and foremost challenge of working with an agent is that there is an inherent bias uh, by the agent of where you should go, what you should study, etc. because of the financial incentive that they have. Now being a commission-based agent, as you can imagine, they get paid only if you go to a university that has offered them a commission. In some cases they only get paid if you go to the university and stay there for at least a semester. So there are many different modes of uh, payment and understanding between the commission-based agent and the university, but at the end of the day there is a financial incentive and that creates a bias because they might quote-unquote push you to an institution even though that might not be the right program or the university for you. In many instances, over and over and over, and we see a lot of that here in the U.S. in our conferences, in our conversations with universities, my conversations with students, that the situations that the students find themselves in is mainly because the agents that they worked with didn't fully understand the nuances of the U.S. education process. Uh, most of them, at least the ones that I have met over the years, have not studied here, so they don't really fully understand, or nor have they lived here. So they don't fully understand the nuances of what the education system is like, the requirements, the process. It's, it's quite different from the Indian education system. So when you're sending a student here, you'd really want to understand that student's capacity and the capabilities and make sure that they're going to what we refer to as a right fit university. So there are some challenges that stem from that main issue. The other challenge that we see working with agents is that they limit your exposure and application to only those universities who pay them a commission. And as again, uh, because there's a financial incentive, there is no incentive for an agent to encourage you to apply to an institution which might be a better fit for you that might offer a better program or might cost a little bit better in terms of your pocketbook is concerned because they don't make a commission and it's human nature so I guess if I was in the commission based business I might actually do that as well and I, I just want you to understand that when you work with an agent these are some things that you should probably ask are they working on a commission and what's the commission structure and how they work with these universities etc cetera, etc cetera. And then the biggest thing, challenge of working with an agent is for the most part, again, I'm generalizing here based on all of the experiences that, that we've had collectively, 
uh, they control the whole process and are not very flexible. And what I mean by that is when you walk into an agent's office and you provide them with your information and your interests and your profile, they take over the process for you. They are the ones identifying the universities. They are the ones applying or at least telling you which ones to apply to and going through the process, in some cases writing the SOPs, uh, generating the letters of recommendation. So everything is controlled by them. And this leads to a couple of problems. One, you're as a, you as a student are not fully aware of what this university is, what they offer, the benefits of attending the university, because you have not done your own research. And when you go to a visa interview at the end of the process, one of the biggest things that you have to jump over the hurdle is convincing the consular officer that you obviously intend to come here to study and two, that you've done your research, that you've made a, a, a you know, informed decision about the institution that you are, you're attending or that you plan on attending. And this is where we see a lot of these problems arise, where a student shows up to a visa interview, and I've spoken to many consular officers and say, you know, it sounded very much like a student who came from an agent because they gave me scripted answers. Uh, because in the process of preparing for the visa, visa interviews, many agents might tell you to say things like, this is the best university, this is the best program, and we all know that can't always be true. And so when you go in with the scripted answers and the consular officer has heard the same exact answer from other students from that same agent, uh, it kind of uh, creates a red flag for them. Um, the other instance is that the process which includes in some cases the agent themselves scheduling your visa interview. The consular officers know where the visa interview was scheduled from based on IP addresses, right, of a computer. And if they notice that multiple visa schedule, the interview schedules came from the same IP address, <clears throat> they know that it's some agent at work. And the minute they know that you as a student are coming through an agent, they, I think their defense mechanisms go up a little bit because of all the issues that they have seen over the years. And so this again creates an additional hurdle for you to cross when you're going through this process. The other challenge of, of a situation like this, and this is a real life example uh, that one of our uh, staff dealt with recently, is a family and a student were working with an agent and they were pretty far into the process when all of a sudden the agent pulled out of the, uh, the engagement for whatever reason, I'm not sure what the real reason was, but the agent stopped working with the, uh, the, uh, the family and the student. Now the student and the family have not only spent time and money, but they have put all their hopes on this agent to get their daughter to a university. Now they're left in a lurch because not only do they not know which universities the agent has applied for, they have no way to learn about what acceptances they've received or what requirements are still pending for those universities that they've applied. And this has created, obviously, as you can imagine, a very painful situation for the student and the family where they've had to restart the process from scratch, which isn't obviously uh, advisable, especially late in the game uh, when it comes to January, February timeframe. And the last thing that, one of the challenges, I, I talk to a lot of parents in India and they say, well, why would I not pay somebody some money and get things done, right? 30, 40, 50,000, whatever the agent's charging, it's worth it, we pay them, they take care of it, and we don't have to worry about anything. Well, first and foremost, it's money that you're spending that, that could be spent somewhere else. Uh, two, the entire process, except for maybe the application fee and a, a fee for a standardized exam and obviously the fees for the visas, et cetera. Everything else is free. The information is free. Your access to that information is free. Uh, your understanding of programs and universities and procedures and requirements, it's all free. So I always question for parents and students as to why they might want to spend money when most of the process is free because obviously you're going to be spending a lot more money after you join the university here. So these are some of the challenges of working with agents uh, on the ground. Uh, let me switch quickly and talk a little bit about the impact on students. Uh, and this is where some, in some instances it breaks my heart, in some instances it makes me really angry. 
because of everything that we know. We know that students in India are looking for great opportunities to study in the U.S. We know that there are wonderful universities in the U.S. that offer some excellent programs across the board, all over the country, over 4,000 universities in this country. And there are people at every university that are designated to work with students across the world, including India, obviously, to help them through the process. Now, when we find that students have, for one reason or another, utilized an agent on the ground, and the agent has misled that student and their families, and has created a situation where the student finds themselves in a very, very terrible situation, not just emotionally and financially, but even from an immigration standpoint, which could really hurt them in the long term. And when this happens is when we really get upset about what, what's going on on the ground. And this is why sometimes we're very vocal about working with commission-based agents. Uh, some of the impacts that we've seen, they, uh, students end up at the wrong university, uh, whether it be a wrong fit or it's not the right program for the student. And let me share a couple of examples of something that's currently going on in the U.S. There have, there's been some movement within the Department of Education to uh, strip some powers from some accreditation bodies in the U.S. that might not be accrediting the right kinds of universities. Many of you over the years might have heard of Tri-Valley University. This was back in 2010. Just last year, a year and a half ago, you might have heard of Silicon Valley University and situations like that where students were sent to a university that shouldn't be in the business of recruiting international students, shouldn't be in the business of education to begin with. And the students come here based on an agent sending them. The agents made their commission, the students have paid their fees, and then they show up and they find that they're not at a, a legitimate university. Or in those cases last year, if you remember last December, several students were denied entry into the U.S. After everything that they went through with the hopes and the dreams of getting on a plane and coming to the U.S., uh, just imagine being denied entry either at the port of entry here or in many students' cases, the airline, Air India themselves, denied them entry in Hyderabad or denied boarding in Hyderabad because they, don't, they, they knew something was going on. And in recent months, uh, similar incidents have surfaced in the U.S. and most recently last month, one of the accreditation bodies called ACICS was stripped of its power and as a result a few hundred universities in the US that are accredited by that body no longer are accredited which means the degree that they offer is not valid anymore. So if you're a student that has been sent to one of these universities, if you're currently a student there clearly you're not getting a degree that's accredited. If you're a former graduate, which we're seeing a lot of students that are in the OPT process, they are now in a lurch because their OPT process isn't going to be renewed. Uh, if you're a student with a graduate uh, degree from that university, your H-1B process might be delayed because it's now in a in not accredited university. And in your cases, most of you are looking at universities to come here yet. So if you're one of those students, how would you know uh, if you're being sent to a legitimate university or not. So this is one of the biggest incidents of, um, I would even go as far as saying fraud, uh, where students have been kind of sent into situations where they shouldn't be. Uh, it's very, very unfortunate. I know I might sound really uh, um, upset or angry about this, which in some cases I am, but I just want you to know that uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the students are finding the right homes, and when people send them to wrong institutions, it really, really hurts them. Uh, the other thing that we see a uh, negative impact on students that happens is there are false promises made about opportunities once the student arrives in the U.S., and I've seen this over and over and over where an agent might convince a student or a family to say that they could potentially come here and get an on-campus job that pays X amount of money every year, which basically will cover all of the expenses, uh, the tuition and the fees and the room and board and everything else, so that the family back home shouldn't have to worry about sending more money. Now, that is false because there is no part-time job uh, anywhere in the U.S. that would pay enough 
to cover an entire year's worth of expenses, which could be up, upwards of thirty, thirty-five thousand um, dollars. That is not true. I have met many students that have been in these situations where they are forced to leave because they can't pay a tuition. So if they can't pay tuition, the school dismisses them, which obviously removes them from the immigration status. And you know, it's just only a matter of time before uh, they have to leave the country. And again, another you know, series of cases. This isn't a one or a two incident cases. These happen all the time. And all of this can be traced back to agents in India who are given misinformation or not enough information for students to make their decisions. And this next point I cannot stress enough. Uh, in terms of the jeopardy that you can find yourself in, when an agent has completed the entire process for you. And if you talk to university officials, this is one of the main things that they uh, are concerned about, that they receive fraudulent documents or recycled application material from agents all over the world, which includes India, over and over and over. And this obviously then puts the student in some kind of a blacklist, right? Because if you're a student and on your behalf an agent is applying for you, they're sending documents. Uh, and when I, when I refer to fraudulent documents, I some, you know, these are the things that I've seen. An agent will send a mark sheet that's been altered so that you look more uh, admissible to a university, or better grades, et cetera. Uh, agents have sent in TOEFL or IELTS or GRE, GMAT, SAT scores that are altered, again, to make you more admissible. They might send SOPs, letters of recommendation that are recycled from other students that they've used. In many cases, the uh, essays or the statements of purpose that they write, they've written once and they just change the name of the student and send it again. When an admissions officer reads multiple applications, they can easily tell that it's the same exact essay with just different names. So all of this creates situations, right? So when you apply, the university might deny your admission. So not where you should have legitimately gotten admitted to university for because of an agent's work, now you're not getting admitted. And I alluded to this earlier a little bit. When you go to a visa interview, many of these things come back to bite you, right? So when a visa officer is looking through your paperwork and then they can detect that maybe there's some fraud happening, you're again denied a visa, which adds to the burden of you having to prove the next time around that you really are a legitimate student. I can go on and on and on about instances and situations where students have been really uh, put in a situation they should never be in. I mean, just imagine when you have to travel all the way to a new country and you're coming with a lot of promise and a lot of hope and you arrive here and for not you what you did, but for somebody else there, you find yourself in situations that are very, very detrimental, which is very difficult to manage. I already said that, so visa and your immigration status uh, I just alluded to it earlier with this whole ACICS accreditation. A lot of we're seeing thousands and thousands of Indian students right now in the U.S. that are in immigration hell, as I call it, because of finding themselves at institutions that they should not have come to in the first place. Um, I know I sound really bleak, don't I? I apologize for that. Uh, I guess I'm very passionate about this, and I want to make sure that I share my thoughts with you today uh, because I want to make sure that you're successful in your process as you go through. Um, again, many instances where the student finds themselves dismissed from universities, deported back to India, but the agents already made their money and they're scot-free. They already took the money and they're on to the next group of students. We just recently saw this year and a half ago with the university that dismissed 25 of the 40 master students that came from one agent in Hyderabad and the students were found uh, inadequate in terms of their academic preparation to be in a master's program but they were obviously sent to the university, the agent made the money and now the students, I don't know what happened to many of them but I'm guessing many of them had to go back home. 
Um, so let me uh, wrap this up, talk a little bit about what you should be doing in terms of um, uh, your preparation, right? As you think about and as you plan and as you go through um, the process. And my computer froze again. Oh, there you go. Um, do your own research and about universities, programs, requirements, everything. You have to be knowledgeable about what you're doing, even if you use an agent and even if they do everything for you. Because I found that in spite of what I say or what many people say, people still go use agents because of the ease of use. So if you're deciding to go use an agent, please, please do your own research. Ask a lot of questions about which institutions uh, they're applying for you or they're introducing your, your application to. Make sure you do all of the research so that you're fully prepared for whatever questions arise later in the process. Uh, there are organizations out there. I don't know if you've heard of an uh, uh, organization called Education USA or EdUSA. They are in seven different cities in India. The Education USA office is a state department, the Department of State here in the U.S., their office in India to promote American education. That's all they do. So you can trust the advice that they're giving you because they are the official office of the Department of State. I would also offer that, you know what, we have an office in India and we have staff in Chennai and Bombay and Bangalore and pretty soon in Ahmedabad as well. Uh, we, like I said, we offer unbiased counseling because we believe that students in India who are interested in studying in the U.S. should be provided with all of the information and the assistance they need without having to pay for it. And because we've created a model where we don't rely on a commission from a university, we are committed to making sure that every single student gets the help they need and finds the university that they should go to regardless of whether or not that we, we have any relationship with the university. It's irrelevant to us which university is a good fit for you. We just want to make sure it's a good fit for you. Um, again, I know sometimes it might be challenging when you work with an agent because they like to control the process. And one of the main reasons why they do that is because if the process is out of their hands, then the university could claim that the student didn't come through them and if they could prove that then they, they don't have to pay the commission. So I don't want to get into the details of that but you know what I mean. But as much as you can, you should be completing your own application. You should be applying. You should be answering the questions that are on the application. You should be writing your own statement of purpose. And let me just say this, no university in the U.S. expects you to write Shakespeare worthy a letter, uh, essays or statements of purpose. They want to just hear from you personally. And this is one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you is make sure that regardless of how you think your essay came out or your statement of purpose came out, if it's an original product, it'll hold a lot more water than somebody else writing it for you. And if you need a second opinion about the essay or the SOP that you've written, call our office. We will review it for you and offer your advice and how you can make that uh, better or make some changes to it. Make sure you're getting your own letters of recommendation from faculty that you work with uh, and not a canned letter that the agent already has. So every step of the way, you need to be involved and you need to do it. So my point is, if you're going to be involved in doing the research and applying on your own or writing your own SOPs, I'm not saying don't get help. There are organizations that can help you. But if you're doing all of that, be cautious and be careful about what kind of an organization you seek help from. I'm not saying you only have to use Education USA or you only have to use our International Knowledge Center. We can't help every single student in India, obviously, because we're not in every single city. But if you're out there seeking somebody's help, make sure that they have your best interest in mind. Because at the end of the day, it's your life that you're putting in someone else's hand. Um, and I can't stress this uh, about the visa interview. You have to prepare. Uh, as of right now, this is January, so in the last few weeks, a lot of students went to the embassies in India to get visas. The visa denial rate, from what I hear in India, has gone up significantly this year compared to pre or previous years. And a lot of things, I think, are kind of making that, you know, creating that situation 
and a lot of it comes down to the visa officers combined with the Border Patrol here, Customs and Border Patrol, are starting to see massive amounts of fraud. Uh, not not in, a, in a major fraud way, but in the sense that creating fraudulent documents, giving wrong answers to get to the university in the U.S., and then switching universities or not actually attending the university. So there's a lot happening here that you might not see, but we are aware of that all the time. So the visa interviews are getting tougher. So the only way you can almost guarantee yourself a successful visa interview is if you are prepared fully about the program, the university, even the location where it's at, why you chose the university, everything. Because the officer will ask you and they don't want to hear a canned answer that they probably heard from another student from the same agent a few minutes before you. So please, please prepare appropriately for the interview. Um, and then last thing I will say is that this could be a whole another topic and maybe one of these days we'll offer another topic uh, on this is to help you transition to the universities here. Uh, just the last couple of weeks there have been uh, instances where students are reaching out to us because they have uh, arrived in the U.S. in September, have gone through the first semester and had some issues with the transition because it's it's uh, challenging, right? When you come here and you're on, on your own and you have to cook for yourself and live on your own, it's a lot of a lot of transition there, and not to mention a very different style of education. The rigor of American education is a lot different than the rigor of Indian education. So, a lot of things happening at the same time, and a couple of students that are currently in the process of conversation with us, uh, they have not done well academically in the first semester. As a result, they're facing dismissal from the program, which is again not the ideal situation. And again, these students aren't at bad schools. They're not, uh, you know, at wrong universities. Or they're not bad students or anything like that. They just weren't prepared uh, to make that transition appear appropriately. So that's part of your process as you go through to make sure you're arming yourself with all the information. And again, Education, Education USA can offer that. We would be happy to offer you that information and help you prepare for that. And, um, and hopefully you, you'll successfully transition here. Last but not the least, I would like to leave you with this. Every university has the staff to help you and answer all your questions. You do not need to pay someone else for this information or help. But I understand at the same time, having said that, accessing the uh, staff at the university sometimes could be scary, sometimes difficult, challenging with the time difference and everything. So you, you will need help across, along the way. But if you are along the way in the process and you need additional help, please call, call us, email us. However we can help you, we'd be happy to help you. And you know we'll go from there. Um, I'm going to switch over to Q&A and looks like we have a few questions lined up. Um, the first question is, uh, I'm a civil diploma holder, can I apply to the U.S.? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. My assumption is that you're saying that you just have a diploma, like a two-year diploma after your high school. Is that correct? If you can clarify that in the question box, I can maybe answer your question better. Um, if that is true, if my assumption is right that you only have a two-year diploma after high school uh, or maybe even after 10th standard, sometimes people do diplomas in India, um, the answer, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, you can apply to a university in the U.S. and you can get uh, admitted to a program. It all depends on what program that you're applying to, what courses you've taken up until your high school and in your diploma program, all of that comes into play. So. Uh, like I said, short answer, yes. Uh, much uh, deeper answer, I, I would need to know uh, every single detail about your personal situation so we can counsel you uh, accordingly. Okay, so please reach out to us. Uh, the next question is, uh, or a comment rather, uh, it says, my agent says I only have to pay if I get a scholarship that he helps me get. You know, uh, it's really interesting that lately we're seeing these new tactics that agents are using. 
saying, oh, I'll help you get in. If you get in, I can get you a scholarship. Then you pay me a percentage of that scholarship. <coughs> you know, what's interesting and the reason that irks me is that the universities that are, that are admitting you are also offering these scholarships. They're not reserved just for these agents. They're not reserved just for a particular process or a particular way of coming into the university. These are public, publicly advertised scholarships. So if you apply on your own and if you get in, you would be eligible for the same scholarship. So the agent's not doing anything extra or special to get you a scholarship. They're using this tactic just to kind of uh, try to uh, maybe prove to you that, hey, no, I got you into university and I'm going to get you a scholarship and then you pay me a percentage of that scholarship, a roundabout way to get money from you, uh, which in some cases, if they're getting a, a commission from the university, they're double dipping, right? So they're getting a couple of thousand dollars from the university, a couple of thousand dollars from you. Uh, that That's not good. Uh, you shouldn't have to uh, rely on, on an agent to get a scholarship and if somebody promises you a scholarship uh, just be uh, wary of it. Um, yeah, uh, one thing I will add to that is that you should never have to pay to get a scholarship from a university. I hope that makes sense, right? So uh, that's a good general rule to go, go by, right? So if you talk to a university if you're, if you're applying to university directly and you're applying and you're talking to an admissions officer, would you offer them money to give you a scholarship? No, you wouldn't. Uh, obviously, that's not how it works. So you shouldn't have to pay an agent to get you that scholarship, right? So it's not like they're doing something special uh, for that. Uh, let, while the other questions are coming in, let me kind of go back, and I know I, I threw out a couple of acronyms and some jargon. Uh, let me clarify that since we do have a little bit of time. I referred to accreditation and ACSCS and then all these acronyms earlier. What I mean by that is there are different levels of accreditation that occur in the U.S. There is, there are many bodies of accreditation that are uh, in the U.S. The most legitimate and the one accreditation that the majority of universities in the U.S. have is through the Higher Learning Commission. Right? In our jargon, we refer to it as regionally accredited. Uh, and the other one I was referring to, ACICS, there are a couple of other bodies out there similarly acronymed that we refer to as national accreditation. Now these usually, these bodies usually accredited universities who are private for-profit universities. You should be looking at universities that are non-profit. There are public universities which are funded by the states, each of the states in the U.S. So you could refer to them as public universities. And then there are private universities that are run by endowments and private organizations or groups but that are also nonprofit. Those institutions are also regionally accredited. They're legitimate. They're accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. So those are all good, like Harvard, right? You've heard of Harvard? So those are the kinds of universities that are regionally accredited. So as you go through the process, just be aware uh, that you're, you're looking at the accreditation. You, these are the questions you should be asking the agent so that they know that you know that you, you know something about this process. And if you're looking for information on a university, I would say their website is the best. Uh, and I, I do this myself. When I hear about a university that I've never heard of, uh, and there are many of them that I've never heard of, I usually go find them on Google, go to their website, look through their website, and always go to the About page. Somewhere within that page should be information on accreditation. If they don't have any accreditation information, that's a red flag. If they do, then they should clearly tell you who accredits them. And if it's the Higher Learning Commission of a, a regional accreditation, then you're good to go. So that's one way to do it. Okay. Uh, let's see what the next question is here. Um, what about the rumor about the reduction of the OPT time period with Trump as president? Uh, thank you for that question. I was expecting something to come up about Trump on the election. 
uh, let me uh, tell you this. We, I mean, we don't know what all is going to change uh, with the new administration and the new policies. But as of right now and for the foreseeable future, the OPT rule that's in place, which is a uh, one-year OPT with a 24-month extension if you're in the STEM program, is still valid. H-1B policies beyond that are still valid. Things might change, but I want you to know that OPT and H-1B are legislative processes, which means they have to go through both the houses and there's got to be a lot of discussion, a lot of agencies involved. This is not something that Trump can start on January 20th and the 21st he can come in and say OPT is no longer available. He can't do that. Uh, it's not that easy. It has to go through the legislative process. So as of right now, uh, all of those are still in play. And if you're currently a student here or if uh, you're planning on coming here soon, those are all the things you should plan for. Having said that, I will also add one other thing. Yes, there is a lot of concern about how OPT rules might change, H-1B rules might change, and they're constantly changing. But the one thing that is not changing is the demand for qualified graduates of universities here in the U.S., particularly in the STEM programs. And as many, uh, the majority, I should say, of Indian students that come here coming to the, come into the STEM program in science, technology, engineering, and math uh, related areas. So the demand for those graduates is an all-time high, and it's projected to be even more so in the future. As we look at demographics here in the U.S. and graduates in the U.S., we're seeing a reduction in the number of American students going into the STEM programs and the number of students that are graduating with those degrees. So the demand's always going to be there. Please don't let rumors stop you from pursuing your dreams, please. Um, I've done a bachelor's in mechanical. Can I apply for a master's of science in data science? Uh, and the answer is yes, obviously, uh, you can apply to any program that you're qualified for. Will they reject my visa interview because of a stream transition? Um, no, uh, it's not that cut and dry, right? It's not like a visa officer would say, wait a second, you've got a mechanical engineering degree and now you want to go to data science. Uh, why would you do that? This is what I was talking about earlier. If you're prepared to go and articulate to the visa officer why you're doing what you're doing, if you say, uh, ma'am, sir, I, I got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering during my program. I found that I'm really interested in X, Y, and Z which led me to explore programs in data science and I found these five universities and I applied and I chose this one because th these are the kinds of research uh, that faculty are involved in that I'm very interested in and I've already been in touch with faculty, et cetera, et cetera. Now that is a valid story. When you're able to articulate a story like that, the consular officer would have no reason to reject your visa. So don't don't think about it in those terms. It's not that cut and dry that you have to do a master's in an undergrad pro in a program that's related to your undergrad. But that is exactly the same as your undergrad program. Okay. Um, so let's see. There's my visa got rejected because I have a backlog. Can I reapply? What changes can I make in my application? Uh, obviously, if you have a lot of backlogs, um, you have to prove to them that you've completed a course of study in the U.S. to continue on for a next level of course here in the U.S. Um, so you, you would want to complete all of that before you go back because the diploma is important, right? You have to have a diploma before you can come in to do a, a program here. So if you don't have that, uh, it's, it's, it's something hard to prove to the uh, visa officers, right? Um, let's see. Uh, there are a lot of technically specific questions that are coming through here. Um, so instead of getting into the weeds with each and every single one of you, I would suggest that you should reach out to our office. I'm going to flip the screen here. Uh, hopefully this will go through the next screen. There you go. Um, you know, I have uh, Yashika's information and Rebecca's information on here. Uh, but I did not include Sheila's information, who is our director of the IKC in Bangalore and that handles a lot of the graduate student questions and support. 
So if you're interested in reaching out, and I recommend that you do, uh, her name is Sheila Tiagaraj, and you can reach her at Sheila, S-H-E-E-L-A, at myikc.com, or best way to do it is you go to our website, myikc.com, and there's a little registration link on the top right-hand corner for both undergrads and grads. And if you're a grad student, click on that and complete it. And if you're an undergrad, click on the undergrad link and, and send in your info and we'll help you. Um, let's see, there's a couple more questions coming in. Um, Uh, there's a question here about uh, facing with the problem of financial status. Is there any way they can fulfill their dreams of studying in the U.S.? You know, as with many students, finances can be challenging because of the exchange rate and the cost of education in the U.S. There are many scholarships, uh, many assistantships that you can avail yourself of. So it's all in the process. So for for students like that, which there are many of that we see, we always advise, well, identify universities that offer a program of your interest, identify universities that are offering scholarships to attract Indian students, because there are many that are offering scholarships. Identify universities where maybe you can go on and take on some research roles or some other kinds of roles on campus where you can get additional financial support from the university, thereby making your education pretty inexpensive and almost comparable to what you pay in India. Uh, again, these are obviously very specific questions and it's, it has to be very strategic, so it's got to be one-on-one, -on -one, and that's why we're here. Our office, our entire team in India and here in the U.S. is here to help you go through your individual situation and make sure that we um, uh, support your uh, process and help you accomplish your dreams. Um, so there's some other questions on what documents do we need from the professor who is accredited to place me as a graduate research assistant. I mean, obviously the university, if they're offering you a research assistantship, should be sending you documents to prove that they are. That should be reflected in the I-20 form, and it should also be accompanied by a letter from the department saying that they've offered it to you. So all of these things... Um, will uh, help you. And you actually, you, you have to have all of those things before you go into a visa interview. Uh, there's an age-related question here, which let me just quickly address that there is no limit on when you can go study or where you can go study. So it doesn't matter how old you are. Uh, if you're committed and motivated, you should be able to apply to a university and you should be able to get in uh, if you can prove your admissibility. and you know, and continue on with that dream. So don't don't let age limit you. I've known, I've seen 70, 80 year olds here in the U.S. go back to college and get their degrees. Uh, Evelyn, how are we doing on time? I think we've gone just about time, right? So again, uh, thank you so much for your time this evening. I know it's a Saturday evening, so we really appreciate. Uh, you sparing some time to go through it. Uh, please spread the word uh, about all the things that I shared with you. And lastly, I would suggest that uh, as and when you're going through the process, feel free to reach out to us. Actually, I'm asking you to reach out to us, myikc.com, and one of our team can help you with whatever uh, your goals are. And again, uh, thank you, and please spread the word about the uh, our organization as well because we're solely committed in India to help universe, uh, students in India get to the right universities in the U.S. So with that, I want to thank you all, and if you have other questions, please reach out to us offline at myikc.com. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great night.